In the vast collection of gods and supernatural beings in human beliefs, the name Yahweh, the God of the Bible, stands out and has been remembered for many centuries. Why is this name so influential and deep? Could Yahweh have ties to the Anunnaki that we don't know about? Today, who is he really? Is he an all-powerful God that is worshipped by religions that come from Abraham? And if not, who or what could Yahweh really be? We'll find the answers in the new episode of Secret Origins. Welcome. The holy books of Abraham's followers tell us about a god who seems to run a grand show in the cosmos. This god creates the universe, stars, animals, plants, people and everything we know. This all-powerful maker often goes by the name Yahweh in these texts. This name isn't just a tag, it's like a door that lets us see how people's ideas of God have changed over time. It represents our never-ending quest to understand the universe and our place in it. The name Yahweh has had a big effect on our shared history, shaping societies, influencing customs and guiding the story of humanity. Looking closely at Yahweh is more than just studying. It's like going on a trip into the heart of our culture, trying to understand our shared past. But what does this mean for our understanding of divinity? What mysteries might we uncover about our origins? This trip takes us back to where civilization first started in the ancient Near East. Could this be where the name Yahweh first emerged? Here we start to dig into a fascinating and complex story. Interestingly, this trip to the Near East brings us face to face with the Anunnaki, who were the gods in ancient Mesopotamian myths. And as you might know, not only, these gods played a big role in stories about the world's creation and were worshipped by the Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians and Babylonians. But could there be a link between these ancient gods and Yahweh? Is it possible that Yahweh grew out of or even came from these Anunnaki? Finding these answers lets us uncover a hidden layer of ancient stories, changing how we understand the beginning of humans. There's an even older story hidden in the Genesis text that has been kept out of public view for hundreds of years because of translation mistakes and the rules of the church. But what is this ancient tale trying to tell us? By the end of this journey we hope to answer the big question. Who is Yahweh, the God in the Bible? And what implication does this have for our understanding of religion and spirituality? Our oldest reference to Yahweh is found on the Moabite stone or the Mesha steel, erected by King Mesha of Moab around 840 BCE celebrating his victory over Israel. The steel recounts a story similar to that found in 2 Kings 3, albeit with one crucial difference. The steel proclaims a Moab victory, while the Bible claims victory for Israel. Interestingly, the reference to Yahweh reinforced the belief that he was exclusively an Israelite deity as Misha brags about seizing objects associated with Yahweh and presenting them to his own good Chemosh. Fast forward to 1844 when archaeologist Carl Richard Lepsius excavated the ruins of the ancient city of Solep in Nubia. Extensive excavations wouldn't take place until 1957, led by the archaeologist Michaela Schiff Giorgini. They found a reference to a group known as the Shasu of Yahweh, inscribed at the base of one of the temple's columns. The reference to Yahweh connected to the Shasu suggested that this god had been worshipped by another group long before the biblical narratives are thought to have occurred. The Egyptians described the Shasu as Semitic nomads, often viewed as outlaws. While attempts were made to connect them with the Hebrews, these claims were rebutted. The reference to the Shasu of Yahweh not only pushes the origins of this deity further back than previously thought, but also states that Yahweh might not have been Canaanite in origin, but if not, then what's the origin of the first Yahweh?
One theory suggests that Yahweh was a desert god adopted by the Hebrews during their exodus from Egypt to Canaan. Fire-related imagery in the book of Exodus, along with Yahweh's ability to guide Moses to water sources, underpines this idea. However, many believe that Yahweh originated as a minor god within the Canaanite pantheon and was adopted by the nomadic Shasu during their time in the Levant. The word Yahweh itself is an ancient linguistic artifact rooted deeply in Semitic languages and carrying echoes of the civilizations that created it. Intriguingly, it seems to be linked to the verb to be, giving it a sense of existence. Other interpretations of its meaning include he who makes that which has been made and he brings into existence whatever exists. The word Yahweh evolved into Yehovah in the late Middle Ages. The name Yahweh could also be derived from the Arabic language, potentially indicating a passion or commitment of the deity towards his people, aligning with biblical references to Yahweh as a jealous god. Yahweh's transformation from a local deity of the Midianites into a sole deity of Israelites is mirrored in the evolution of his name, starting as a reflection of a local deity's commitment to his tribe and evolving into a declaration of existence and commitment of the one true God to his chosen people. In Judaism, the name of God was considered too sacred to be spoken, so the consonants YHWH were used as a reminder to say Adonai, Lord, instead. The origins of Yahweh remain obscure with biblical passages, differing in their interpretations. After the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BCE, Yahweh's power was codified and the Hebrew scriptures were canonized during the Second Temple period, including the concept of a Messiah. Yahweh as the all-powerful creator, preserver and redeemer of the universe was later adopted by early Christians who believed that God sent Jesus as the promised Messiah. In Islam this deity was interpreted as Allah. Now, back in time during the Iron Age, the Israelites in Canaan sought to distinguish themselves from their neighbors by elevating Yahweh above El, the supreme deity. Yahweh's association with the forge, fire, smoke and smiting made him a suitable deity of storms and war, transforming him from a deity of transformation to one of conquest. Once known for his blessings of fertility and prosperity, El was a highly respected and frequently called upon deity. At the same time, Yahweh was emerging from his origins as an obscure regional god linked to the wilderness and stormy weather and becoming a powerful presence within Israel society. The dynamic between El and Yahweh was far from simple, riddled with conflict and integration and marked with Yahweh taking on roles and traits previously linked to El. Yahweh's rise to dominance is unquestionable as he transitioned from a local deity to the sole god of Israelites, a process marked by intricate religious evolution and transformation. This transition is clearly mirrored in early Israeli poetry and narrative literature, which often portrayed Yahweh as a militant figure. His elevated status as a national god was mostly cemented through Israel's wars. During times of peace, the tribes would turn to Baal, the god of fertility, however in times of conflict, they sought help from Yahweh, the divine warrior, looking for triumph. The depiction of Yahweh as a divine warrior is a recurring theme in the Hebrew scriptures, which also form part of the Christian Old Testament. Even the New Testament borrows from this warrior imagery. In the earliest days of Israel, Yahweh was seen as a storm god of war, a powerful deity tied deeply to the elements of nature. This portrayal of Yahweh might have been influenced by the Canaanite religious nearby, which also worshipped storm gods. Given that the people of Israel lived in an area prone to severe weather, it's no surprise they leaned towards a god representing these potent forces. Thus, they worship spread to include gods like Il, Asherah, Baal, Utu Shamash and of course Yahweh. When they first settled in Canaan, the people practiced ancestor worship honoring the god of the father 
or the god of the house along with their human ancestors. However, Yangfei was seen as more than just a storm god. As they interacted with surrounding cultures and their spiritual practices, Yahweh's image changed. He started to be seen as a god of fertility and protection, and a dispenser of justice. It's likely that this shift was influenced by Asherah, the Canaanite goddess of fertility who was widely worshipped. Despite Asherah's popularity, her worship sparked major theological arguments. The Israelites, particularly those in the southern kingdom of Judah, were leaning towards monotheism and saw the worship of Asherah as a threat to this emerging belief. The prophets like Elijah strongly opposed the worship of Asherah and other Canaanite gods, leading to violent clashes and the eventual suppression of Asherah's following. Political factors of the era also played a role in shaping Yahweh's worship. The northern kingdom of Israel was richer and more open to syncretism, blending elements from different religions into their worship of Yahweh. This approach faced strong opposition from the southern king of Judah, which was moving towards exclusive Yahweh worship. When the Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom in 1722 BCE, it marked a critical turning point in Yahweh's worship. Refugees from the north joined the southern kingdom, bringing them their blended religious practices, which likely influenced the evolution of Yahweh's image and the development of unique Israelite religious customs. As the people of Israel built their society in Canaan, they wanted to stand out from their neighbors. This led to them prioritizing Yahweh over El, the traditional Canaanite supreme god. However, they didn't fully embrace monotheism yet. The people remained henotheistic through the era of Judges and the Kingdom of Israel. The kingdom split following Solomon's death in 1931 BCE, leading to the creation of the southern kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem as its capital. In Judah, worshipping Yahweh was not a religious act, but it was also a part of their identity. Yahweh was seen as their protector. The people of Judah believed they were chosen by Yahweh, which influenced everything from their religious traditions to their political decisions and cultural ways of life. Yahweh was seen as a warrior god, a shield against enemies, a perception that was likely influenced by the tumultuous times Judah lived in. Surrounded by mighty empires and frequently drawn into their disputes, the people of Judah turned to Yahweh for safety and rescue. Their faith in Yahweh's protective power had a direct impact on everything from their military strategies and diplomatic ties to their domestic policies. In Judah, the worship of Yahweh was supported by the state. The kings of Judah, starting with David and Solomon, were seen as the earthly representatives of Yahweh. They were believed to have been chosen by Yahweh to lead his people, which gave them both political and religious power. They were the protectors of faith, charged with keeping its practices pure and upholding its principles. However, the relationship between Yahweh and the kings of Judah wasn't always smooth. There were times when kings motivated by political gain or personal ambition strayed from the faith. They brought in foreign gods, allowed blended practices in Yahweh's worship and persecuted the prophets who dared to criticize them. These actions were seen as betrayals of Yahweh that deserved divine punishment. During these periods of religious change, prophets emerged as the moral compass of Judah. They were seen as the voice of Yahweh, guiding the people back to their God. They spoke out against idol worship, condemned injustices in society, and warned about the severe consequences of abandoning Yahweh. Their messages were not always well received, but they were crucial. They were the guiding light leading the people of Judah back to Yahweh whenever they strayed. But the question remains, why do we as a collective society continuously revere this deity born from the pages of history as the one true God? What compels us to give thanks, beseech blessings and croon praises to this entity? Might our fascination with the divine reflect a deeper urge to explore our own complexities and unravel the mysteries of divine identities concealed within sacred texts? Could it be that our minds are drawing us 
an intriguing maze of cosmic knowledge and self-discovery. It's as thought we're cracking open an ancient vault, decoding whispers of divine echoes that have resonated through time and space. Could this adventure not only reveal the secrets of the Anunnaki and ancient aliens, but also illuminate our understanding of ourselves and our place in the cosmos? Acknowledging that Yahweh was not initially a single deity but evolved into a monotheistic god is crucial to perceive the extraterrestrial influence on our civilization's growth. Now, it's important to understand that Yahweh's evolution from being one among many to being the supreme deity worldwide happened along two pathways. Firstly, from a human viewpoint, we've been exploring how the shift from polytheism to monotheism in ancient Israel was a slow and complex process spanning several centuries. In the late Bronze Age, numerous deities were linked with powerful cities in a typically polytheistic society. Israel had its national deity Yahweh but still acknowledged a pantheon, much like other ancient Near Eastern states. Over time, Yahweh started assuming a dominant role, slowly transitioning towards monotheism, a path marked by social, political and cultural alterations over time. Secondly, the theological transition of Yahweh to the soul deity represents the perspective of the divine entities themselves. The ancient aliens theory positions these beings as a physical entities that visited our ancient past, bringing into question whether Yahweh was a specific entity or a name for a group of individuals. The connection between Yahweh and our channel's primary focus, the Anunnaki, is evident since regions where names of Yahweh, El, Asherah and other gods emerged are the same regions where the Anunnaki appeared and were revered. Delving further into this analysis, we find striking similarities between some of the renowned Anunnaki entities and the characteristics of Yahweh. Yahweh's journey from a divine warrior to a supreme deity over all others, a creator, a blessing, a salvation provider, a father god is interesting. Observing Anunnaki gods Enki, Enlil and Ninurta shows intriguing parallels with Yahweh's characteristics hinting at possible overlaps and transformations. Examining the Mesopotamian god Enlil, the god of weather and war and the father of gods, his narrative has parallels with the biblical accounts involving Yahweh. However, Yahweh's distinctive quality as a warrior doesn't align with Enlil's image. Instead, Enki, the god of knowledge, sciences and hidden metals, shares a closer alignment with Yahweh's qualities. Enki's wisdom, understanding and control over gold and silver parallel Yahweh's attributes in the Bible. Another Anunnaki, Ninurta, the god of agriculture, hunting and war, shares his protective nature and warrior qualities with Yahweh. However, suggesting that Yahweh is merely Enki or Ninurta or any other deity cloaked in Biblical Hebrew disguise is oversimplification. It is necessary to study the nuanced relationship and the roles of these deities in the Sumerian and Biblical accounts to truly understand their connection and evolution. Consequently, the study of Yahweh's transition from being a deity among many to becoming a singularly revered God involves understanding both to the human-driven socio-cultural political shifts and theological changes from the God's perspective. It's a complex, an intriguing study that broadens our understanding of the Anunnaki and ancient alien theory providing new perspectives on the development of our civilization. However, it's important to note that Ninurta was not regarded as deity in hiding by the earlier Sumerians, and depictions of him were not uncommon. Yet, as we delve further into the Yahweh Ninurta connection, we find a substantial ancient text that shines a light on a significant event challenging the idea that Ninurta and Yahweh are one and the same. The specific text concerns a remarkable and unforgettable occurrence, the specific details of which suggest that Ninurda could not have been Yahweh. One of the most pivotal acts attributed to Yahweh in the Bible, with lasting consequences and enduring memories, is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The event is also chronicled in Mesopotamian texts 
allowing for a comparison of the deities involved. In Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah cities, located in the lush plains south of the Salt Sea, are depicted as sinful. Yahweh descends from his dwelling and, accompanied by two angels, visit Abram and his wife Sarai near Hebron. After foretelling that the elderly couple will have a son, Yahweh sends the two angels to Sodom to evaluate the city's sinfulness. Yahweh then informs Abram that if their sins are confirmed, the cities and their inhabitants will be destroyed. Abram implores Yahweh to spare Sodom if at least 50 righteous people are found within its walls. Yahweh agrees to this plea after Abram successfully negotiates the number down to 10 and departs. The angels, having witnessed the city's wickedness, urge Lot to take his family and escape. Lot asks permission to seek refuge in the mountains and the angels consent, postponing the impending destruction. Eventually, the doomed fate of the cities is triggered as Yahweh reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, so furious fire from the skies, and he upheavened those cities and the entire plain and all its inhabitants and all that which grew on the ground. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where had stood before Yahweh, and looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, towards the land of the plain, and he saw smoke rising from the earth like the smoke of a furnace. In the Mesopotamian records, this very event is trialedly documented as the climax of Marduk's battle to establish dominance on earth. The Mesopotamian text explicitly attributes the upheaval of the sinful cities of Nurgal, not Ninurta, given that the Bible asserts that it was Yahweh himself who unleashed the destruction on the cities, rather than the two investigating angels, it becomes apparent that Yahweh cannot be equated with Ninurta. In his book, Divine Encounters, Zacharias Sitchin grapples with the enigma shrouding the identity of Yahweh he draws a remarkable conclusion. The idea from the Bible that the Allahim, the gods or the Anunnaki had a god of their own, might seem utterly absurd initially, but upon deeper reflection, it seems to make a lot of sense. This leads us to pose a critical question. If the Nephilim were the gods who created man on earth, was it just evolution on the 12th planet that gave rise to the Nephilim? These technologically advanced beings capable of space travel hundreds of thousands of years before us and deriving cosmological explanations for the solar system's creation must have also questioned their origins. This could have led them to what we define as religion, their religion, their concept of God, where according to Sitchin, Yahweh isn't an Anunnaki but rather a divine being that even the Anunnaki revered. Now returning to our initial questions, we've probed the contrasting viewpoints about Yahweh's identity, the human historical perspective and the God's own viewpoint. This intricate tapestry of perspectives underscores the topic's complexity as well as its interconnectedness. The imposing nature of the Anunnaki topic and the potential of the ancient aliens theory to rock the world's religious perceptions becomes clear. Mainstream religions often fail to inspire a deep, intimate connection with the divinity that permeates, that is, in all things. They tend to project God as a distant, judgmental entity who, despite his proclaimed love for us, keeps tabs on our actions. But in our view, our true spiritual quest leads us inward. It invites us to explore the divine within us, when we truly connect with our essence and an authentic religion is our own inner self linked with everything. As for Yahweh, well, Yahweh, along with the other gods, deserves due respect for their roles in history. They've shaped our civilization, culture, bodies, and life itself. And that's all there is. We bow before you and thank you for watching another episode of Secret Origins. Keep your minds open and until we meet again.